It's the unthinkable. Nearly one million Rohingya refugees have been driven out of their homes and villages in Myanmar into neighboring Bangladesh. It is by far one of the world's largest humanitarian crises today. The Rohingya are descendants of the ancient Southeast Asian kingdom of Arakan. Its borders face the Bay of Bengal to its west, the Indian subcontinent to its north, and Burma proper to its east, isolated by the Arakan Mountains and accessible primarily by sea. In the 8th century, Muslim traders brought Islam to Arakan where the religion spread. In the 18th century, Arakan was conquered by the neighboring Burmese people. Until recently, the descendants of the Arakan, now known as the Rohingya, lived isolated from the majority Buddhist population in what is now called the Rakhai state of Myanmar. But Myanmar denied Rohingya the right to citizenship, their basic rights to study, work, or access to health services were severely restricted. Beginning in 2012, Western leaders started to take notice. In Rakhine State, we see the danger of continued tensions there. Then, in August 2017, tensions between the Rohingya and the Burmese boiled over. Rohingya rebels attacked Myanmar security forces. The military quickly counterattacked. The violence against civilians has forced more than half a million people to flee for their lives. Hundreds have been killed. At least 200 villages have been burned to the ground. The word is genocide. We must shine a spotlight on these accounts of ethnic cleansing. This is the story behind the catastrophic humanitarian crisis affecting Southeast Asia and the story of the people trying to help the Rohingya. Look around me. This river it's part of the border between the nation of Bangladesh and the nation of Myanmar. It's a short distance from the Rohingya refugee camps. And this is one of the border locations where many desperate Rohingya refugees under the most unthinkable conditions cross this river fleeing for their lives. <laughs> There are about one million Rohingyas here in Bangladesh. They're living in very tough conditions with very uncertain futures. Not every Rohingya was able to escape to Bangladesh. Many, numbers unknown, were murdered, slaughtered. The United Nations has identified these vicious acts as ethnic cleansing. You've heard the phrase, never again. But those words ring hollow here. It has happened again to the Rohingyas. They came to one of the groves to our village and then came to our markets and they looted all of the expensive things, and then they set fire. Also, they come into our village and shooting the, everywhere, just firing, like shooting the, like this, uh, on fire. No meat, no discuss, no question, just shooting. When Mohib Bula's village was attacked, he traveled for eight days to reach safety. I have heard that uh, that there was killings, shootings, yeah. killings with machete, yeah. rapes of women. Yes. Um, do you know Do you know anybody who was killed by a machete, shot, or raped? Yeah, a lot of people we we know. When they burn in our uh, villages and the market, that time I saw with my own eyes. Did you see anyone anyone killed with your own eyes? Yes. One of the one of the my villagers also killed on their way. What, running and got shot. Yeah. Yeah. Kasim was a school teacher in his home village where he can trace his family history back at least four generations. My family is also the, one of the brothers who were killed by the Burmese government. So you're taking care of your, your brother's child, oh, yeah. sister in law, your yeah. brother's wife? Yes. How, how do you deal with this? I love him very much. No, I am taking care of him. He is my daughter's child. 
Why do you think that the Myanmar military did this? The government trying the whole country to be Buddhist. So this is a religious dispute? Religious. It is a religious thing. <laughs> They're trying to be Buddhist country. All will be Buddhist. I heard several stories like this claiming that the attacks were religiously motivated, Buddhist on Muslim, and calculated to drive out the Rohingya. No government confirms that story, but the Rohingya here believe it. I had to leave my children in the midst of firing and chaos. What could I do? So, so she was in her home yeah. when the military of Miramar showed up. Is that right? Yes, that's right. What happened to the village? The village was burned. As the houses were set on fire, a lot of the people could not get out. Some were hacked to death or their bodies were lit on fire. Little children were thrown away violently. How did you get separated from your two children? In Myanmar, our home was attacked suddenly by gunfire. That moment, I escaped through an open door, and I grabbed one of my children who was close to me. Soon I saw my whole house was on fire. I do not know what happened to the others. There was no way to know who was shot or who was butchered. I could not find out. I just can't even imagine how hard this is. I, I, don't, I almost don't know what to say to you. you know, I'm at a loss for words. My son was five, my daughter seven. What's her name, in case anyone is watching? Shahida. And what is your, boy, what is your son's name? Mahmoud al Hassan. So for now, the new home for the Rohingya is in neighboring Bangladesh, the Kutupalong refugee camp. What was once a lush forest is now a sprawling slum that reaches out for miles. I had no idea how big it was going to be, so seeing just how huge the camp was, just on and on and on with all of the people, that was kind of my first impression was just the huge scope of it. Like I'd heard about it, you see the statistics, you see the numbers, but to be here in person and seeing how extensive it is, that's something completely different. Like once you get in, besides just looking at the physical stuff, looking at like the people, the feel of the camp when I walk through it, there's just this sense of a lot of people that are just kind of surviving, not really living, just kind of getting by day to day. An initial settlement of refugees already existed here, but after the violence in August of 2017, the camp started to grow by enormous numbers. When they arrived, the Rohingya had no homes, no shelters, no source of heat for cooking, but what the land held was trees. And one by one, they were cut down. The trees that held the hillsides became campfires and shelters that now stretch to the horizon. Kaylin Briggs is an American who has worked in five countries in the last five years. She is now with World Vision, a relief agency which is active here. She has seen the growth. When we had this massive population influx last August, um, we had to expand the area where those people were living. So what we're in now is called the expansion camp. So it's basically a much larger camp that's built sort of around the original site. All right, well, how, any idea of what the population of the expanded camp is? About it's over 600,000. Of the expanded camp, that would include the original camp too? That doesn't include the original camp. So oh, it does not? No. So if you include the original camp and all of the little bits around it, we're up to around 900,000 people. So this is the largest refugee camp in the world but they are cut off. They cannot leave the camp. Officially, the Bangladesh government has even put restrictions on the sale of SIM cards to refugees for their cell phones, citing security precautions. Formal education is not allowed. Some organizations sponsor language lessons for children, but not in the local trade language, Bengali. Though there is little to do, there are few sources of entertainment, no television, limited internet, 
and only weak radio signals with little information in the Rohingya language. Since refugees don't have work permits, they are officially not allowed to have jobs. It's fertile ground for the breeding of extremists and terrorism. We often say in these types of emergencies that idleness is one of the biggest threats. When, when people have too much time, when they don't have the opportunity to work or do things, that's when we start seeing risks go up in camps. Hey, 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 hello, 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 kids are kids, and they try to keep busy. And while the Rohingya may not be able to fill proper jobs, it doesn't stop them from working. You do find some computers in use here and there, but I'm told that their usage also requires permission from authorities in the camps. So no work, no schooling, no movement, not much of a life. No one, not governments, not relief workers, and least of all the Rohingya themselves, knows how long they will be here and when or if they will ever be able to return home. And there's more. Another pressing, potentially disastrous enemy has come to the Rohingya. Here comes the rain. Can I get under your thing for a second? This is what the million people, the million Rohingyas in this refugee camp are having to put up with. This is the monsoon season. This is a crisis on top of a crisis. It is raining like crazy. It's not going to stop raining. This is no ordinary rain. This is a monsoon. And what's happening, what's already happened, is there are mudslides. But that's not where it stops. I mean, look, at here is, here's a latrine. But the latrines are filthy. And what happens is they make the water filthy. There's water running all the way through here. You can see the water underneath, underneath me. It just doesn't stop raining. And it's just a breeding ground for all sorts of diseases. You've got cholera and so many other diseases that come when you have filthy water. And that's just the beginning. But how can anyone expect these people to get food to live? How can you expect their structures to stand up? And now the structures are literally gonna wash down upon each other. Bridges are washing away. This is what the spotlight needs to be put on because these people are desperate. But it's only gonna get worse. The danger is clear to relief workers like May Sepan of Food for the Hungry and Medical Teams International. Essentially, their settlements are built on what appears to be sand dunes because they're deforested lands that have no way of protecting the population against the monsoon rains. And so it's very likely that most of these settlements will get washed out as the rains increase and the storms become more intense. We identified something like 200,000 people are at risk from landslides with this heavy monsoon. It's almost like a race against time. Shelley Thackrow gave up a career as a journalist to work in crisis environments just like this one. We've been trying to really move families as fast as we can to flatter, safer land, so relocated to a part of the camp which has been flattened, but also so that safer shelter can also be built. The constant rain would strain a first world infrastructure, let alone a makeshift camp. The water builds, pools, and seeps into everything and sets up a potential for danger to the vulnerable refugees. And as the rains continue, the toilets are overflowing into the wells, and so many more of the clean wells will become contaminated as rainy season continues. With that, we get major outbreaks, infectious outbreaks such as acute water diarrhea, possibly cholera, dengue fever. There's quite a few different outbreaks that we are worried that might occur. I walked the camp with Rebecca Derry, the country representative for Samaritan's Purse, a U.S.-based Christian relief organization. Dozens of agencies from all over the world, including the United States, have sent teams to the camp to help the Rohingya. They're providing medical care, shelter materials, food, and dozens of other relief services. 
the camp is too large and the need too great for just one agency to handle it all. They've split Coup de Pelong into a number of smaller camps where individual charities take responsibility. What is this camp called? Where This is still the Camp 12? Yes. 20,000 plus live here? 20,000 plus. And you can see how all the houses or homes are built into this hilly terrain. So when the monsoon starts in earnest, um, it creates a horrible danger. Absolutely. So what's to protect these houses from pancaking on top of each other? Nothing. Nothing at all. Has anyone died so far from the mudslides, as far as you know? Yes, we had a child under five die two weeks ago from a landslide. What happened? I mean, what do you know about it? I mean, in his home or? He was in, it, his home was crushed from the, from the slide. Where was the rest of his family? I don't know. How did you find out about it? Um, it was, we get reports about all the things that happened in the camps. <laughs> and so it was one of the things that was reported, unfortunately, that we lost him. What efforts are being made to, uh, to protect these families from these mudslides? I mean, I don't know that anything can. I mean, they've lifted all the, the, uh, the trees here and built them into homes. They've used everything, so there's nothing to hold the soil in, even if it would withstand the monsoon. That's right. So they are trying to move people out as quickly as possible to areas that are a little bit more stable, but it's a slow process and there's not a lot of place to put them. But even do the people want to move again? I mean, they've already been run out of Miramar. I mean, this, as horrible as this is, this has at least become home. You know the person who lives next door to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're trying, they're making an attempt to move people in family groups so that they still have that feeling of placement. But yeah, it is really hard to uproot a second time and move somewhere else. And I notice over here that there are bags. I assume that's an attempt to, to prevent a mudslide. So what you're seeing there is that's places where there were homes and they have been taken off so that, because that's a high landslide area. So these little spots where you see, that's where people have been moved out. All right. So when so when people get moved out, they they take their homes. Yes. What is like? Look at all this this huge roof-like area over this. What is? It? So this is an attempt to keep the sand from coming down. So they are also planting grass. They're trying to plant plant grass so that it will stabilize the soil a little little better. And they put bamboo and tarp over it to keep it from falling on these lower houses. Oh yeah. Take a look at this. This is incredible. This is where a house probably was. And they move the family out. Um, I'm stepping over this bamboo. They move the family out, and then they, they take the house and get rid of the house so no one moves in. But take a look at, you can tell there's just a cliff with a little bit of rain, the monsoon, you know, that whatever is here is just going to slide right down on top of these other homes. I don't know why these places don't burn down in fires. I mean, coming down these steps is actually treacherous. Um, it's unbelievable how dangerous even these steps are. It's very slippery. You can, you can see that I can stretch it. Here's the house, and at the other end of my hand is the cliff. So you know what's going to happen when the rain comes, when this cliff gives way. This house is going to go tumbling down on top of those other homes. This is very narrow passage, and the rains, I mean, if, if you've never been in a monsoon, I mean, it's just, it's not like your ordinary rainstorm. It comes down in buckets, and water literally washes away the land. Now that the rains have come, it's a race against landslides. Several organizations are working to move families to safer ground. I met Michelle Bornstein from New York. She works with CARE International over in Camp 16 to relocate who she can. We did a site survey um, that recognized that of the shelters, uh, there were 810 that were particularly vulnerable to mudslides. They were, you know, on overhangings, they were in gulfs, they were in really risky places. But not all of them could get moved. Um, so only about 460 of them could be. So 400 are still at risk for them? So 400 of them, we gave them extra shelter materials to just try to mitigate a little bit against some of the slopes. But I mean, um, it's, it's, it's a daunting task. I mean, look at these hills. And we've been through, you know, we've, we've seen what the monsoon has done. It washed out a road that we were on today and just in, in a short order. I mean, the, the monsoon's going to go for months. These, these 400 families still at risk. Uh, it's, it's not academic. This is pretty serious. No, and, and beyond that, you know, um, some of the households that we didn't think were at risk uh, were destroyed in last week's rain. So uh, households that we didn't think were particularly vulnerable had mudslides that weren't anticipated because we didn't quite understand the way the land would work, what the soil quality in all the different areas was. Do you have, do you have all the money and supplies you need? <laughs> no. This is a new era? Yeah. Are they building their own houses? 
So essentially what happens is, is that um, we give materials and we give training and then we lend support to vulnerable households. So most households build their own, um, but you know, women headed households, um, households with elderly or children headed households, um, we have laborers do most, most or all of the construction. While I was in Camp 16, I met Fatima. When her family fled from Myanmar, her husband was killed. Her son lives in the camps, but is so traumatized that I'm told he just roams around aimlessly. She was helped by care. When we first reached Bangladesh, we took shelter at the bank of a river, but there was land erosion. Then some representatives from CARE told us that there were some new shelters being built further inland. They advised us and then helped us move here. But for every person like Fatima, there are dozens of others needing immediate help. The needs come flooding in every day, every hour, every minute. I mean, just take a look at this. Since the time we came into the camp just a short while ago, the monsoon started pouring water in, and this road has now washed away. But it's not just a matter of fixing the road easily. This is a crisis, because take a look at down here. Look how soft this land is, and the rain is pouring in. So every time you turn around, there is a more dangerous situation that has arisen. Take a look at this road. They're trying desperately to fill it with soil, do something. But who wants to get on a car or even walk across it when it, the road is so narrow and the, is giving way like this and is pouring rain? And it's not just a matter of getting into the camp and transportation. How do you think they're going to get food in here if they can't bring a truck in here? How are they, they going to get medical care, medical equipment? Every single moment, the crisis builds. This is, this is interesting. Here comes an ambulance. Before I was talking about how dangerous it is, how do you get cars in to help people? This is an ambulance. Hello, sir. It's very dangerous, very dangerous up there. You might want to drive slow. I, go. I don't know yeah. if you can go or not. They say that, but I don't know. It, uh, you'll be the first to go through, and it's... It's pretty, it's pretty narrow. Why don't you get out of the car and go look at it? I have a patient already. Do you have a patient Dio, in there? Dio. Do you have a patient in there? Yeah. And I have a patient. Where are you trying to get it to the patient to? To the hospital right there. We're up on the hill. See, this is this is what the danger is. This is an ambulance. And when I say something new happens every five minutes, before I was talking about how the road washed down, how dangerous it was. Now we've got a patient in an ambulance trying to get to the hospital up there and this road is supposedly repaired but even my own weight i can push the soil down we well, you know if the rain comes i don't know what happens when your know, heavy vehicles go through every time you turn around there's another bigger crisis and you wonder how much more can these people endure how much more and it just doesn't stop For the refugees, it's a perfect storm. Persecution, mudslides, idleness, disease. While there is much that is good that is being done here, this camp has also become a target for those who would come to pray on the Rohingya. The Kutupalong refugee camp in Bangladesh is just across the river from the home of the Rohingya. The Myanmar military has driven nearly one million Rohingya to this camp. The international community has condemned the government for the violence against Rohingya civilians that amounted to what the United Nations termed as ethnic cleansing. Every woman or girl I spoke with reported having either endured or witnessed sexual violence. It is imperative that the international community take decisive measures to address this grave crisis. Most have little or nothing to go back to. Their homes and villages have been destroyed. We are struggling. We need resources fast. It's a humanitarian crisis only made worse by the monsoon rains. The Rohingya here are caught in limbo. They cannot have jobs, there are no schools, 
there are few sources of information. They sit idle, unhappy, and largely dependent on aid supplied by international governmental and non-governmental organizations who have sent good people to help. One child, one child. But besides those who bring relief, others are drawn to the camps to take advantage of the crisis. As so often happens, the victims are victimized a second time. Most vulnerable are women and young girls who are targeted by traffickers to be lured or taken and used for forced labor or sex. I discovered traffickers after sunset. Five o'clock, there is no furnace and no locals allowed. I met with a human rights activist in nearby Cox's Bazaar. Ali Kabir had worked in agriculture his whole life. He says he could no longer remain silent while others were suffering at the hands of some Rohingya who themselves had fled years before. Only old Rohingya, those who are registered here uh, since 1978, 1991, old Rohingyas, they are staying in Bangladesh, they know everything. Then every rules, they are very familiar with Bangladesh culture. Human traffickers hiding them. And they go inside the camp and uh, talk with the families, convince them that they were going to provide a good job, a better uh, future, better life uh, abroad, and better uh, opportunities like this. So the people you, that are involved in the trafficking are Rohingyas who have been here in Bangladesh long before uh, the latest uh, exodus of Rohingyas from Myanmar? Yep. So, so you're talking, the, the population that's doing the trafficking are Rohingya who have been here in Bangladesh for a number of years. Yes, they are the, be, uh, become a broker of the uh, big trafficking network. How do, they, how do they get the women out of the camps? Because the Bangladesh government won't let the Rohingyas leave the camps. I mean, the Rohingyas who came over from Myanmar in the last year and a half can't leave the camps. So how do the brokers get them out of the camps? Uh, well, ma'am, I tell you, here uh, in Bangladesh have no system in check post. Uh, they are in check post, they check only uh, Bangladesh NID card, national ID card. And the uh, human traffickers obtain a uh, fake national ID card. He also showed me pictures of the women he says were victims. So she's Rohingya yes. from the refugee camp, and they were and they had they had broke they were going to sell her or bring her out of the country. Yes. D what was she getting paid? Do you know? And what was the offer? Offer was uh, providing her uh, in a beauty parlor job abroad, Malaysia, Thailand, and uh, providing her you know in a job in a factory. Did you ever speak to her parents or her family? Yeah, I speak to her parents. They was uh, very in shock after they learned a real story, real thing. So they thought it was a legitimate deal that she was going overseas for this career? Yes. Did any of them get emotional? They just requested me uh, not to tell this thing to the other people because uh, her future will be dark. Future in terms of getting a husband or future employment? Uh, uh, not husband. Husband, really? And, uh, husband and uh, the community will not let them live in peace. So it's a, it's a very much a cultural thing as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, the people who are going to insult them, will, they will not get a well respect and they will not get a, a, a sitting with the other relatives, they're going to hate her. They will look at her in a very, you know, in a bad eyes. Are Rohingya families protesting about this or complaining? Or are they seeing anything if a member of their family is, you know, goes off into some uh, sex trade? Well, ma'am, where are they going to protest? There is no any uh, uh, proper place where they can go submit a complaint, where they can go seek a legal process, where they can go uh, seek justice, where they can go. I was in a forced marriage for eight months. I 
was told the army could take me away by force. It would be better if I got married in order to save my honor. Since my mother is blind, she agreed to marry me off. We had just arrived in Bangladesh for the first time. We didn't know anything about the place. We didn't know the laws or the rules. We came here with a lot of fear from all the violence. They are very helpless, hopeless. There was no police. They're in the camp, nothing. And there was, uh, you know, uh, in a fear. And they given the daughter to him. So she goes with him. Was she crying or screaming or upset she, or agreeable? I mean, what, she what? don't want it to him. I was so fearful. I'm just a teenager. But they grabbed my neck and I was so scared. That's why I was crying a lot. I was so upset. My mom said God has not given permission, but those people said it was God's will to get married to that man. My mom turned to me and told me to just accept my fate. And where he can go ask protection? And the parents said, I'm sorry, we are helpless. Uh, he is going to kill us and we have to give the, my daughter to, to him. This man came and took her, and I guess took her, is that for sex? Marry her. Uh, so this would be wife number three. Yeah, marry her. Later, when the first wife uh, pressure, pressuring him, he let her. So he let her go? Let her go. This Rohingya girl have no value. No value? No value. Because she's Rohingya? Yes. Zero? Zero. And there's something else the Rohingya here don't talk about. When the Burmese military attacked, they didn't just kill and set houses on fire. They raped. And the victims of those rapes are here now. They face a terrible stain that their own culture puts on them and on their newborns. We're seeing a lot of women that are coming in right about now that have voiced to us that the, the babies are a result of rape. Sarah Rawlings is a nurse from Seattle, Washington. She both treats and counsels the victims. The challenges she faces are heartbreaking. It's a really, it's a really hard one. We've seen some pretty dire things happen as a result of unwanted pregnancies. Are the women having babies in their homes? Yeah, uh, many of the women are having babies in their homes. I'd say the majority are having babies in their homes and are not coming in here. Just the other week, one of our community health workers found a, a baby that had been left in a latrine was still alive, but covered in feces. Um, they've been actually trying to track down and find the woman, but since the baby has been taken in to another organization and they're feeding the baby and trying to offer support and find community members that can help raise the child. So they expect this child to survive that was they found do. in the feces yep. in the latrine. I believe the child right now is at a uh, Doctors Without Borders hospital. Are there, is that an unusual situation? Are you finding other situations where women are trying to either terminate yeah. their pregnancies or having difficult births? Or are you finding more of that? We're, we're seeing more and more. And we've had several, probably 20 plus women that I've spoken with since I've been here that have told me they want to terminate their pregnancy and that they don't want the child and that the child is a result of, of rape. Rohingya. The culture is very complicated. Even the rape victims, those who have been raped by uh, Mahima military, you know what they say? Oh, she have a evil in her belly. Stay away from her. If you've been raped by the Myanmar military, they were saying evil in her belly, stay away from her. I want to talk with uh, one pregnant from the rape. Other uh, Rohingyas advising me, Sir, please don't talk to her. She has evil in her belly. What happens after the baby is born? She has no place in the society of Rohingya. Zero, the, none? Zero, yes. Her life is dark and everybody comes to know. A lot of Rohingya uh, girls, those who have been raped by the Myanmar military, they're hiding. They're hiding, they're suffering quietly, silently. They don't want to expose, they don't want to say, they don't want to uh, say nothing. It's 
So what do we do? What can we do? What's next for the one million people who seem to want little more than to go home? More than a year after this crisis began, there's a lot that seems normal in the Kuta Palong refugee camp. You see it best when the rain stops and the sun comes out. There's now something of an economy here and a social structure familiar to the Rohingya. Because communication with the outside is so difficult, when news comes in, it spreads like wildfire from person to person. It's not always 100% accurate, but it's a way for the Rohingya to believe they are not being forgotten. The one nation that is focused on the Rohingya is the host country, Bangladesh. But even though the country is devoting resources and energy, it seems clear Bangladesh does not want the Rohingya to remain. In fact, the Bangladesh government only reluctantly calls them Rohingya, preferring the term forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals. That's a reminder that this is all temporary. Myanmar says it will welcome back the refugees, but in refugee camps, not their villages. And even if that occurs, the government of Aung San Suu Kyi says they will still be denied citizenship and officially remain stateless under the Myanmar constitution. They will still be stigmatized. People here doubt that without international intervention, they will ever see their home villages again. When you talk to people in the camp, they say they want to go home. Um, they are absolutely clear about that, but they will tell you, we want to go home when it's safe to do so and when we are able to access our rights in Myanmar. And so far, um, we haven't seen much progress, and they tell us that they haven't seen much progress um, in seeing conditions improve for them. And so I think that's, from our point of view, where we really do need to see governments like the U.S. stepping up not just the financial assistance but also the diplomatic engagement to try to come up with a solution to this crisis that enables people to eventually be able to return to their homes in a safe and voluntary way. If there's any sort of silver lining in this cloud is that you really are inspired by the people who are here who are really trying to help so many who are in desperate need. But this is a task that Frankly, no matter how much people want to help, you know, there's not enough. So we feed more than 850,000 people a month. It costs more than $20 million a month to feed families. So that's urgent. It's still important that we don't forget this community. It's still important that we support this community and that we make sure that women and children and those who are most vulnerable get the life-saving food that they need. And so for many of the groups that are here, there's just not enough funding to meet the needs that we have. We've got a lot of skin infections, skin and disease, a lot of dehydration, diarrheal diseases. We've had a huge kind of mumps outbreak and then diphtheria, diphtheria is on the tail end coming down but really uh, malnutrition, then also a lot of kind of obstetrical needs. Americans are generous, people are generous all over the world, so tell me, uh, what do you need? What do we need? Yeah, oh so, what do you need? Do you need, where, like, if you, if, 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 here's your chance. Is there something you yeah. I mean, What would you like? What do you need here? This is gonna be here a long time, so I think more people is, you know. Volunteers and yeah. people are Yeah. Do you see people with malnutrition coming into? Oh, for sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, food, for sure, funding, always. What about medicine? Do you have enough medicine? Are you short of anything? We're short. Medicines, what you, yeah. What do you need? What's short of? Um, I think yesterday the one they said was loratadine. What's um, that for? For allergies. We love more antibiotics. I think we're out of like Tylenol syrup. So we have kids with fevers all the time. I had a, a baby with a fever of 105 yesterday. And so I think what they're having to do is dissolve tablets into water and then give to kids. So it's like just simple things like like paracetamol syrup. You know, it's amazing how innovative you know these field hospitals are. Mm -hmm. The fact that you know that you know that you can quickly do that. The rest of us run off to the drugstores. So right. They... Exactly. This is the intake facility or area of the Samaritan's Purse Clinic here in Bangladesh. Why am I wearing a mask? 
Because people are coming in with unknown illnesses, so we are here keeping people safe by using these masks until we figure out what's going on with them. All right. Keeping them safe from me or me safe from them or both? Both. Both? <laughs> so everybody in the intake area wears it like this, right? Absolutely. Rebecca, tell me, what is the official name of this hospital? This is the Isolation and Infectious Disease Clinic. All right, when you first created the hospital, what was it intended to treat? So originally we were here treating diphtheria. And what has become of the diphtheria outbreak? So the diphtheria outbreak has gone down. There's been a mass vaccination campaign. So right now that is not a big issue, but what is becoming a big issue is acute watery diarrhea. And also, of course, when I hear that, I also think with all the water coming down, the fact that uh, there are so many people close together, the possibility, and I say a possibility of cholera. Absolutely. Which, of course, Samaritan's Purse is treated in Haiti and other parts of the world. What happens here? So here you'll be triaged by the nurses and they will decide if you need to have follow-up, what program you'll be following up on, if you'll be getting oral solution or if you'll be getting intravenous solution. Right. Now I notice a lot of people here um, are not American. You're an American, right? I am an American. A um, number of Americans work here. Yes. And they work here for about how long? I mean, the term of duty, what's the term usually? Usually between six and eight weeks. And where do you find the, how do you get the locals who work Yep, here? so these are Bengali nurses who have come to work with us and we've been training them so that they'll be giving care that's similar to the provision of care our nurses can give. Now, Samaritan's Purse had a diphtheria clinic before this here in Bangladesh. About how many patients were you getting in the diphtheria clinic? So in the diphtheria clinic, we triaged over 8,000 patients, and we treated more than 1,100 for diphtheria. All right. So then also the sort of emergency hospital or clinic has been constructed waiting for the next onslaught of what you expect to be the problem. Absolutely. So we have changed the clinic so that we can start treating acute watery diarrhea and any other infectious diseases that might happen. All right. So you get triage through here and you come in here, right? Yes. So this is where Dr. Collin will make a decision about what kind of treatment this child needs. And if it's treatment that we can provide here, we will make him an inpatient. So this is where all the decisions are made about what kind of treatment the child needs. Who's organizing all of this? It's a multi-group organization. We are connected with Doctors Without Borders, the Turkish Field Hospital, other organizations that are providing care. We all connect and talk and decide which patients should go where. I mean, it is really, it's, it's incredible all these organizations here. We're, 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 there are almost a million people in all these camps. Absolutely. Yeah. We've hiked into the inner part of the refugee camp, at least this particular one, through all the mud up and down the hill. It's very slippery. And the reason we've come to this home is that one of the children in this home was treated at Samaritan's Purse, treated for diphtheria, and they thought the child was not going to make it. But this is one of those good stories. So this child came in very sick with diphtheria. He was having respiratory distress. We had to work several hours with him to get the antitoxin into him. So he was really struggling to breathe and we really thought we were gonna lose him for a few moments there. Actually, for a while, we thought we'd lose him. How old is he? He is two and a half. Did you have to intubate him? We did intubate him. Which is, I mean, you, you put something in his mouth to go down his throat and then you use like a bladder to, because you don't have, no, it, we're not here in the United States at some hospital. You, you've explained this to me, is that it's a field hospital, is that you have to keep pumping, keep, how long did someone have to keep pumping that? Hours. Hours and hours. hours. To help him breathe. Yes. And you saved him. We did. What a great story. Oh, he's got the boots And here he is. Oh, he's got his boots on. Oh, he's not happy though. Oh, dear. Oh, no. Oh, dear. And there he goes. Here in the camps, diseases such as tetanus are a deadly threat because so few have been vaccinated. Tabarak came to Samaritan's Purse in April. Uh, his father brought him in because he was having muscle pain, back pain, he was having cramping, and he was having difficulty swallowing. I had such terrible back pain, I couldn't even stand up. I felt like I was going to die. Within a few minutes, it was clear that they believed he had tetanus. So we gave him an antitoxin, which immediately started making a difference for him, but he was still quite ill. So we ended up sending him to Medici San Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, to get further treatment. And he was there for two weeks and then was, had a full recovery. Once I got treatment for my son, I was so happy. And he was able to go home and he is now a healthy teenage boy running around the camps. He's doing so well now. I'm feeling so much better since I have recovered. 
It's, it's daunting some days, but I think we're making progress. Things like providing education to adolescents, providing livelihoods opportunities, providing skills training, and just things to occupy people's time is something that's really important. If we can get that recognition that this will be a longer term crisis and we can get permission to, to start implementing some of those types of activities like the formal education, that we can help to, to sort of counterbalance some of the idleness that comes with displacement. World Vision provides a range of services in the camp, reinforcing the shelters that are in the camp, water and sanitation. I'm sure you've heard we, we run child-friendly spaces. We provide recreational support to help children sort of recover a sense of normalcy. Um, so on average, we have around 2,000 children each week that are coming to our child-friendly spaces. We provide a range of recreational activities. So sometimes it might be drawing, it might be games, it might be um, singing songs. It sort of depends on the day. But really what we're trying to do is provide a fun, safe place for children to come play and be children, even in the midst of all of the difficult things around them. In the area known as Camp 13, I met a boy whose name we've changed because of concerns for his safety if he returns home. Hamid has been drawing about his life. He has seen and gone through things a child should never have to experience. Yeah, he did this all by himself. It says, it says my world, but can you explain it? These are the places where I lived. So was this, what's this? This house was burned to the ground. And that's his house? Yes, this was my home. What's the hand for? I saw a hand that had been cut off of someone, and there was blood. So he, so this represents a hand that he saw where? In the ground, just on the ground? People were slaughtered, and there were dead bodies on the ground. So now we have a, there's a line. Why did he draw a line down the middle? This is his new life? One side is for my life in Myanmar, the other side is for my life in Bangladesh. What's this? That's the boat we used to cross the border. Who are, th are these, like, people? The teachers are teaching the children. And this? Thank you. That is an owl. Oh, it's an owl? What's the noise the owl makes? No, all right. Well, I'm not going to do it for you. <laughs> Tell him I hope that uh, I hope that he continues to do his art. How do you say thank Sukriya. you? What is it? Sukuria. Sukuria. <laughs> he laughed. I'm not very good at Sukuria. Is that like what? Like not so good? <laughs> oh well, I tried, right? Sukuria. I tried. I think when you look at the number of Rohingya refugees in the camps, it's a daunting figure. But when you break down those figures and you are in the camps engaging with these individuals, you realize they're just like you and me. Hi, hello, hello. Where'd you learn it? Bye bye. They are mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, sons and daughters. I mean, their hopes and dreams are no different from our own hopes and dreams for our children and our communities. I want to be a teacher. I want to be able to provide for my family. The United States is known as a country that supports others. And right now, the Rohingya people are really in need of support. Many people back home in the States, you know, they send a couple couple dollars off to Samaritan's person. They, and I always want them to see, you know, how much they help people. Absolutely. You know, and even, even sort of the whole idea of like, you know, the experience of all these NGOs that are, that are here um, is that you know, they, they know how to handle this crisis. Yeah, it's unimaginable to think of what would have happened even in the diphtheria outbreak. If Samaritans First and Doctors Without Borders wouldn't have been here, we would have had a huge loss of life. Well, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people back in the United States say, well, why don't you stay here and help people in the United States? I mean, that's what I, I hear all the time, you know, people in the United States need help. Why are you going there? What's the answer to that? Um, well, my grandpa says the same thing, and what I tell him usually is that 
In the States, we're really lucky that we have resources for people who don't have what they need. If you're hungry, you go to the soup kitchen. Um, if you're in this refugee camp and you're hungry, you starve. So um, unless NGOs like Samaritan's Purse and MSF and Food for the Hungry come here and provide those things, there's no place else for the people to get what they need. It's quite heartbreaking to be here and see the catastrophe that could happen to these people and knowing that mo much of the world doesn't care or doesn't know about it. So it's, it's devastating to me to see this entire people group who, who have such great needs not being shown in the public, not being uh, broadcast in the United States. No one really knows about it and that's, it's really hard to see that. Recently I was in the camp a couple days ago and there was a father with his newborn baby who's I think days old and the baby was sick but he just sort of had this glassy look and that comes from sustained periods of hardship and trauma. People are very resilient however you can see the experience of suffering and traumatic experiences lived in their expressions in their eyes. <laughs> Don't you think I'm very sad? I've given up my home in Myanmar. Lots of people were killed in Burma. I've suffered so much. Here in this camp we are having a miserable life, yet I don't feel anything for life in Burma. Here I'm getting lots of assistance. They have built my home out of tarps, so at least I have a roof over my head. If I go back to Burma, who will look after me? I lost my husband and my son is gone. I escaped here. I have shelter and food, so for that I am thankful. I, I think we're at the stage now where we need to be collectively recognizing that this is not a short-term crisis. These people are not leaving next week. They're probably not leaving next month. And I think we need to be prepared for the possibility that they're going to be here for many months, if not years to come. Here in the camps, the days drag by. More than one year after they were attacked and run out of their villages, the Rohingya remain in Bangladesh. Citizens and governments are now working together on their behalf, but what will happen to them? And they are now alone. More than 60 million people around the world are counted as refugees or involuntary migrants all have their own stories of hardships, secrets, and great need. They all face uncertain futures. But no matter where they are, they all look ahead with hope. The hope that one day they will no longer be displaced.